Today I'm talking about um, one part of my PhD um, dissertation, evaluating the role of environmental drivers that may facilitate the expansion of an invasive macroalga, Sargassum hunteri. Um, before I jump too far into that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. So uh, I grew up in, um, so in California, I'm the oldest of three kids and we spent a lot of time at the beach. Um, and I really grew to love the environment and the animals inside it and started going to ocean camp at about 10, collecting crabs in my hat. And by high school, I was pretty sure that marine ecology was something I was interested in pursuing. I got the chance my senior year to do my very first field study in uh, Bahia de los Animas, which is in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. Um, I had a, they had a class at my high school called marine ecology, where you got to learn all the different species and genus names of algae and mollusks and fish. And um, we spent nine days in Mexico studying a wide variety of different environments. And I was pretty sure that this was the path that I wanted to be on. So I continued studying um, at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, it's a prime location for uh, doing uh, marine research. Uh, as you can see, this is a marine lab located right along Gee, the Pacific Ocean. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks like right over there. Um, and I took classes that had titles like marine mammals, uh, marine conservation ecology, marine botany, um, and I just really loved my time there, and I knew that this was something that I wanted to do. Uh, while I was there, I also got to work with uh, the Coastal Conservation Action Lab, um, and so I spent a lot of time learning about invasive species. Um, and they, what, the work that they do is they prioritize islands for invasive species eradications um, in order to save endangered and critical. Um, species on those islands. So I spent a lot of time on the computer, not so much in the field, uh, but I got to have a lot of experience in the lab and kind of learn what it was like to be a graduate student and really expand uh, my knowledge about invasives and kind of get interested in how invasive ecology works. After graduation, I um, spent three months in the Philippines with a graduate student. And so here I got to do a lot of diving. Uh, while I was at UC Santa Cruz, I became a scientific scuba diver. Um, and I got to uh, do science underwater in the Philippines, which is about the coolest thing I can think of doing. Um, what we were doing wasn't that exciting. We were counting blades of grass underwater. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I could have upped that a little bit. Um, but we were looking to see if um, marine protected or terrestrial protected areas impacted the overall health of seagrass. And so I got to spend three months traveling around islands in the Philippines, which was also pretty rough. Um, and <laughs> Uh, diving in tropical locations and travel. So um, that's kind of when I started doing more field things and knew that that was definitely a component that I would want in my graduate studies. After I graduated, I took some time off and I worked a number of jobs, um, but one of them was a high school educator for Lagoon Ocean Foundation. Um, I especially liked this because I got to be in the tide pools, show visitors around, kind of share my passion, force my passion on other people. Um, and that's really when I started asking myself questions about what was going on and what were some questions I might want to address in a graduate program. What is that second from the right? Is that two species together? That one. That one. This is a chitin. Oh, so it has eight plates, and then these are snails. Are they have spines? Chitin has spines? Um, it's a mossy chitin. So it has oh. like, like little hairs. Step yeah. oh. <laughs> I should look like an urchin with a chitin on top. It kind of does. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen that as a new <laughs> um, So while I was there, there were a number of changes to the tide pools. Um, so the first was uh, sea star wasting. So we lost all the sea stars um, in our tide pools. We also had um, warm water pelagic crabs yes. that started washing up. Yeah, and so that, was, like, that was about four different. years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, sea star versus uh, sea urchin balding, so another disease. And then I started noticing this new species. Um, it turned out to be Sargassum hunteri, and that's kind of how I got to UCLA and my question. So I saw this new species that had invaded, and I wanted to know more about it and how it was interacting with its environment. Uh, so before I get too far, um, let's talk about why invasive species are important. So they're reshaping ecosystems worldwide, and this is an example of loss of biodiversity. So on this side of the fence, invasive goats are allowed, and on this side of the fence, invasive goats are not allowed. Um, it leads to species extinctions, so 54% of known extinctions include effects of invasive species. 
Uh, loss of ecosystem services, so this is Kuaga mussels that have fouled up a boat propeller. Mm -hmm. uh, and loss of ecosystem function, so this example is kudzu, uh, so it has taken away most of the habitat types. Um, all of this interacts with human-induced climate change. Uh, so climate change alters environments. It can open up space for invasive species to invade. Uh, it can facilitate species expansions. On the east coast of the United States right now, we're experiencing an expansion of mangrove forests north as temperatures warm. And it, it interacts with existing stressors to make them larger and cause greater disturbances. Um, and invasive species can be very disturbance mediated. So what is an invasive species? So it's a species that has been introduced to a novel environment. Here I've created a Caribbean reef. And we're going to introduce the lionfish. So once it's been introduced, it has to successfully expand into the new habitat. So now our lionfish are mating. And then it has to cause environmental or economic harm. So in the case of the lionfish, they eat the reef fish in really large numbers, and they have no predators. Hmm. And so they cause this environmental and economic uh, harm in that way. My study species is Sargassum runneri, and uh, Sargassum runneri is now can be considered an invasive under all three of those categories because it has showed up, it has spread, and now we know that uh, kelp bass will not recruit to it. So it likely is impacting uh, the kelp bass population, which is an economically and environmentally important. It's native to Japan and Korea, and it arrived in Long Beach Harbor in 2003. Uh, so likely it was brought over by a shipping vessel, um, and so for a couple of years it was just in the harbor, but by 2006 it was found at three locations on Catalina Island. So here on both the leeward and the windward side of the island. Uh, present day, <coughs> Sargassum Honoré has spread over 750 kilometers uh, from Santa Barbara to Isla Natividad, Mexico. Um, and actually, recently, there's an app called iNaturalist, where actually any of you can have it, and you can take pictures of plants or animals and upload your geolocation, and you can ID it, or an expert can ID it. And I checked it recently, and there was um, a picture in a confirmed sighting in Santa Cruz of Sargassum honorai, so it is likely still spreading. Um, Sargassum honorai is an annual species, so that means it lives its entire life cycle in one year. It starts growing about now. So right now I have a lot of recruits. They're about this big out um, between like this big and this big. I've seen this summer. Um, they uh, become reproductive in the winter. And then uh, in the spring, they start to senesce and die. And that opens up space for the recruitment to happen in the summer and late summer. Uh, they grow to be about three meters in height. They are highly fecund, which makes them a great invasive because uh, they have a lot of recruits. And they're actually self-fertile, so they can reproduce without a second plant uh, nearby. Um, one of the things people are really concerned about is that Sargassum is showing up in places that have historically been kelp forests. And so uh, I just want to talk about kelp forests really quick. Uh, they're very charismatic and lovely. I don't know if anyone's ever snorkeled in them, but they're beautiful. and they're. Uh, they support over 800 species along the California coast, so also very important. They're characterized by cold, nutrient-rich waters. Um, and the, in Southern California, the prominent space holder are like the biggest kind of uh, thing you see is Macrocystis pyrifera, or giant kelp, which is perennial, so it lives over many years. Um, it grows to be about 30 meters high, so it's very different from Sargassum and supports a very different community but it starts to decline at about 20 degrees Celsius. So when we have these warm water excursions that we've experienced in the past, um, kelp have started to decline. Um, so that brings me to my question, do temperature excursions, so I'm gonna call that anything above kind of that 20 degree Celsius threshold, um, facilitate the expansion <coughs> of Sargassum honori by promoting growth. And over the next few slides, I'm gonna tell you why that's what I'm interested in. What's 20 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit? I don't know if the time like I it's 72 or something. It's low 70s, yeah. Um, where I'm going to do the study and how I plan on answering this question. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the El Nino Southern Ocean. And so that's the warming of the ocean surface. So we have above average sea surface temperatures in our tropical Pacific. 
it changes the speed and the strength of the currents. Um, it the it impacts and the health of coastal fisheries, which are usually fine. Um, it reverses our local weather patterns. And normally along the California coast, we have upwelling from the deep because we have a pretty large um, drop off uh, as you get off the coast. So you have cold water that comes up and brings a lot of nutrient rich water, which helps the kelp forest. Um, in, in El Nino, you have downwelling. So warm water is being pushed down the coast. And so that brings in those temperatures that are a little high and maybe um, our coastal species are not doing as well in those cases. Uh, so I just particularly want to talk about the 2015-2016 El Nino. So it's over here. And I'll zoom in in a second. So it was stronger and it was with prolonged temperature increase. It also followed, I don't know if anybody heard about the warm water blob in 2014-2015. So this really long um, period of warm water. So if you look here, it's quite a bit larger even than the 97-98 El Nino. Um, and we saw a decrease in kelp in a lot of areas, and especially an increase in sargassum carneri. Um, I'm doing this study on Catalina Island, as you could probably guess. Um, and part of that reason is Catalina has been impacted by sargassum carneri uh, quite a bit. There's been a lot of other research on removals and um, growth of sargassum carneri on Catalina Island, and they saw a big increase in sargassum presence during that 2015-2016 El Nino. Um, so this is where we are at Wrigley, and this is my dive site here at Isthmus Point. So I am doing some things in the field, so I kind of want to walk you through what that looks like. So I'm tethering algae and seeing how it grows at different temperatures in the ocean. So I'm doing this with three size classes, less than 10 centimeters, 10 to 100 centimeters, and greater than 100 centimeters. Uh, for five days, the algae will be out in the field, and we'll have temperature loggers taking temperatures about every ten, no, three minutes. And I plan on doing this twice monthly to capture <coughs> a wide range of temperatures over the course of the year. And so the sizes I'll get when available. So, so far I've only been able to do two sizes because they're in their young age. And then I want to compare the percent growth with the average daily maximum temperatures. So I have done this twice. In July, um, and let me, before I get there, walk you through what this looks like. Okay, so we go out and we collect algae, and then you want it, when you weigh it, you want it to be kind of a standard wet weight. You don't want to have like really wet ones and really dry ones. So we kind of have a funny process to get through that. We put all the algae in pantyhose, keep them safe, <laughs> and then we put them into a low velocity centrifuge to get all of the water off. You might have one, it's also a salad spinner. <laughs> so we spin an algae salad. <laughs> And we do that for about a minute, and when we're done, uh, we go ahead and weigh and measure uh, the algae. And then I attach it to a rope and put it back in the field. This is what that looks like. You can see this rope in here, or classic Garibaldi, and this algae here with that green zip tie is attached. Um, and so we put it out for five days and then go ahead and bring it back. So science doesn't always happen when you want it to. So in July, none of my algae grew. <laughs> Which really makes it hard to tell how temperature is impacting the growth of sargassum. <laughs> um, so not in weight and not in height, uh, both have error bars at zero, so they pretty much stayed the same. And in fact, in some, I had catastrophic loss in height. Uh, so I went back to the drawing board and I was like, what happened? Um, and I looked at the algae and it was pretty clear that there are so something oh. is eating it, which is good news, <laughs> um, but not if you want to know how temperature is impacting yeah. algae. Yes. Uh, so I started thinking about how I could make some changes. And so one of the things that you can do is you can look at net effects. So that would include temperature and herbivory and interactions <clears> with <throat> other algae and all these things that happen at different temperatures. But I was concerned that the signal from the temperature would be lost um, with that really high herbivorous rate that I was seeing. So instead of putting the algae out on the rocks or on the rope all by themselves, I decided to put half of them in algae jail. <laughs> so I built um, little cylindrical cages that have closed bottoms and closed tops to keep them completely protected. Nothing's getting in there. They're about one centimeter by one centimeter. Um, but what that does is it creates kind of a different bottom um, than they've had when they were just on the rope. So now they have their own growing space 
and they're not interacting with any of the rest of uh, the algae in the environment. So I put all the other half on algae platform. And um, I'm still working on that now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't have data to show you. Um, but these are what the cages look like. These ones aren't closed, but they're very similar. These inside. Um, and they're all on the line. Yeah. So is the algae that you took out from the same place that you're putting it back? Yeah, so we tried environment. to keep within 10 meters, I think, of where we pulled, or 10 feet, some, something like that. It's all from the same area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we go out in the morning, collect it, come back, spin, wet it, put it on the line, then put all of those cages on the boat, and then untangle them. <laughs> and then put them in the water. <laughs> tie them down, and we put like rocks in between each one so the line doesn't come back up. Well, it'll be interesting to effect the spinning might have on this as well. Like, it, yes, although you're... it's been used for a long time, and so luckily, because I'm spinning all of them, they're all receiving the same treatment, mm -hmm. and so they should all be impacted the same. All right, I'm also doing some lab work, um, and so I'm planning on collecting 30 sargassum individuals that are between 3 and 10 centimeters tall. I'm going to put them in mesocosm, so these are little jars that will be full of water. And I have these um, aquarium heaters. And when I heat the jars between 15 and 25 degrees Celsius, same thing for five days. And then compare the percent growth um, with average temperatures. Last summer, I did um, kind of a trial run of this uh, with a much smaller range of temperatures. Um, but I did find that the growth of sargassum moderai increased with increasing temperature. Uh, so they, they did find that high temperature, you know, uh, the kelp does poorly at. Um, in the future, I plan to continue my field surveys on Catalina Island. So I've now done one round in August, and we'll do another two in September um, of my jailed algae. And then continue through the year. And then I plan on doing a mesocosm experiment in February. Last summer I tried to do it in the summer, but the water was so warm uh, that the range was so small that I ended up putting them in a room that was a controlled temperature, but I'd like to be able to do it outside once the water has cooled. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Peggy Fong, the staff at uh, Wrigley, my uh, dive buddy, Emily Reisner, and the Fong Lab, my funding sources. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I'd like to take any questions yes. now. <laughs> What's the temperature in Japan where it's indigenous? How does it affect the environment there if it's not in, in, in competition with the, the kinds of kelp we have here? What eats it there? And what's eating it? I'm sorry, a lot of questions. Did you figure <laughs> out what was eating it when it was getting eaten? Uh, so the range in Japan where it grows is wider than here. Um, okay. So it's much colder and warmer. That's why I thought it would be colder. So I yeah. didn't okay. Um, and in Japan, it's actually um, like a very important species um, that is um, kind of like the kelp is here. It's a foundational species. It's a habitat species. Um, so things do eat it here. I think urchins are eating it and probably snails. Um, we've seen some of them in the open cages. They crawl in. Um, we're getting like little tiny holes on the algae. Um, but I haven't done any feeding trials. I know in feeding trials that urchins will eat it um, if there are no other options. But if there's other algae in the tank, they will eat that first. Hmm. And then, was that all of your questions? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so you mentioned that in Japan, it's part of the ecosystem, important part of the ecosystem. Is it considered an invasive species in Japan? It's actually in decline in Japan, and they're trying to figure out how to get it to grow more. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they like it? Like, what is how it, So is it they don't have a kelp forest the same way that we do, and so that's nat the natural system there is sargassum, and those species are likely they've evolved with it, and so they have oh. different relationships, whereas our, yeah. our species had never seen it before. Um, mm -hmm. We have two native sargassum species in California and now two um, introduced sargassum species. So the other one came in the 70s. Um, but has been, um, it's more intertidal and very seasonal. So it'll kind of fill the pools and then die. Okay, and then just one other part to the question. It's, did, so have you noticed that in California where we consider an invasive species, is it reducing the amount of kelp in our water? I don't, I doubt highly that it is competing directly with kelp. Mm -hmm. My hypothesis is that when kelp or other native species do poorly, it opens up space. 
Uh, but it might be, and my lab partner is actually asking that question. Um, interactions between juveniles and adults and shading between the two species to see if they are, in fact, competing. Have they same resources, right? They want the same resources. So at some level, they are likely competing. Um, I just don't know how much that's influencing the spread or if the spread is more facilitated by uh, space. Great, thank you. <laughs> Is there any um, ideas about how to control it? And as a diver, if I see it, should I pull it out or just? Yeah. <laughs> uh, probably not pull it out. It fragments really easy, and it can stay alive and reproductive for several weeks after it has been pulled out. Um, and so that could actually help it spread. Yeah. Okay. Um, there have been um, a couple of studies that have looked at removals. And one of my other questions, I'm looking at a removal in San Pedro. Um, which is a kind of different environment than Catalina. Um, and it seems like the removal happened just after the El Nino. And so there was a decline after the removal. But I know on Catalina, there was a removal just before the El Nino. And there was actually more sargassum after the removal than before. Was they remove it, they literally take it and put it in a bag and take it out of the yep. water. They don't just. Yeah, no, yeah, they're putting it in bags. They used a vacuum cleaner apparatus. They pull it out and shoot it up to the boat. Oh, mm -hmm. interesting. Is it a food crop? I mean, I don't think so. It it's pretty, from what I, my understanding of it, it's not easy to digest. Okay. You just can't process it more. But I heard somebody was trying to figure out how to like make it into a beer or like, <laughs> <laughs> make a demand for it. Yeah. You know, uh, the <laughs> So there's nothing, um, there's nothing conclusive as far as whether it did because the water temperature fluctuation with El Nino they actually had worked. It could have been much worse than had they not done that. They don't know. Maybe, I mean, so it, the, they did plots without it and plots with it, and it did have less sargassum than the plots than, that they didn't remove it from. Um, but I don't know how long that lasted for because you're also getting like new recruits all the time. Right. And so probably like sustainable wise, it's probably not something that's going to be easy to do. And as uh, global climate change keeps continuing, um, the tropicalization of California will probably include this species. Mm -hmm. What kind of fish do they have in Japan that we need to bring over here that like it? That's, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, they need to <laughs> they get everything out of yeah, no, Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see a preference in the predation on the plants that you planted versus those around it that were natively there? Um, so places that I'm mostly working have, it's predominantly sargassum and deuteotia leaves. Um, so the stuff in the environment looks very similar. I did notice that the, the ones that are a little bit bigger seem to be uh, targeted more. I don't know if it's because like size-wise. Um, they're easier to identify, <laughs> um, but I don't, the ones in the environment, yeah, it's, it's hard to say because it's not exactly what I'm looking at, um, but the dictum chilies are definitely making What I meant well. was if I'm an urchin, I have a choice of your plant versus the plant that's already on right beside it, do you see a preference? I think it's all proximity. Okay. Yeah, if they're on the, maybe with the cages, but I haven't, uh, I've looked that up once. And it was not great conditions. A lot of biology. It's hard to do field work. It is hard to do field work. <laughs> By the way, your presentation is outrageously good. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I had a great time yeah, listening really to it. Really yeah. That wasn't my favorite comment, but uh, strong comment. I, I really stand behind that. So my question <laughs> is, what is what is the overall if sargasm takes over? So like, what's the end game? If it's if it spreads to its maximum capacity, I think figuring out how what that looks like, um, how that's going to impact local economies as well as environments, um, and just kind of figuring out what the future looks like and how hopefully we can make the species here as resilient. Based that on having. How do dense is it? I'm not positive. Uh, like I said, this is what we're looking at in five years. Um, but I know that I don't think there's species diversity. So how are they getting rid of it in Japan? <laughs> 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 Thank 